60 Minutes Rewind. Parts of the country ravaged by Hurricane Florence will slowly dry out and begin to clean up in the coming weeks. Many communities in the Carolinas hadn't yet recovered from Hurricane Matthew two years ago. The relentless cycle of disaster, rebuild, repeat, has many coastal residents feeling numb and helpless. And climate scientists say we can expect more frequent, more powerful storms in the future. We heard that the Netherlands, one of the most flood-prone places in the world, almost never floods. Holland is about twice the size of New Jersey and is one of the world's most densely populated countries. Much of it is below sea level. Yet the Dutch don't bother with flood insurance. They don't need it. As the U.S. cleans up from Hurricane Florence, we were wondering, do the Dutch have a solution? It was a disaster that unfolded in slow motion. For four days, Hurricane Florence crawled up the East Coast, dumping record rainfall, more than 35 inches in North Carolina, flooding thousands of homes and taking dozens of lives. The destruction from Hurricanes Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, and Maria cost hundreds of billions of dollars. Florence is another chapter in a story we know all too well. Every measure as a protective measure. We met a Dutchman, Hank Ovink, who says it's time to rewrite America's disaster playbook entirely. And there's only one opportunity. That is when a disaster hits. It's like an X-ray. It tells you where all your vulnerabilities are and gives you the opportunity to step up and say, we can do better. Ovink is the world's only water ambassador, a role given to him by the Dutch government. We need to take action now. He advises the UN, 35 individual countries, and a dozen U.S. cities. He travels the globe like a missionary, preaching the gospel of flood prevention. But this is your house. This is my house. One of his latest stops was Houston, still recovering from Hurricane Harvey. So what's the biggest challenge in the United States. You're solution oriented. You have a collective. When things happen, you come together. You want to build back uh, and repair uh, and be ready uh, when disastrous things happen. But there's not so much a belief that you can actually prevent a disaster from happening. But how do you go about preventing a disaster like Katrina, Harvey, Sandy? It, it just doesn't seem possible. We can't prevent them from happening, but the impact that is caused by the disasters, we can decrease by preparing ourselves. I think the catastrophes we see in the world are all man-made. The storms are perhaps man-caused, and you can debate that. But the catastrophes, because of the storms, uh, those are man-made. It's a radical statement. We went with him to the Netherlands to learn what shaped his thinking. It's water. Water is everywhere in this country known for its charming canals, picturesque dikes, and windmills. But they're not just quaint tourist attractions. For centuries, the canals and dikes have held back water. The windmills pump it away. Ovink took us up in a helicopter so we could see it from above. From what I can see here, it looks as though the entire country is man-engineered. Yes. We flew over Rotterdam, his hometown, so he could show us how the country has been engineered. How much of this city is below sea level? Um, almost everything. When was the last time this flooded? This doesn't flood. Because of the precautions yeah. you have taken. Yeah. The Dutch allocate more than a billion dollars a year to manage their flood infrastructure. Some of it is massive, like the Maasland Kiering storm surge barrier. These are the gates. Right, they're big. They're enormous. It's like an Eiffel Tower, like the Paris Eiffel Tower on its sides, but then two. Each one the size Each of one. the Eiffel Tower. The gates guard one of the largest ports in the world and most of the Dutch population. They don't have hurricanes like we do, but ferocious storms with hurricane force winds can blow in from the North Sea and push in huge storm surges. When that happens, 
the two arms seal off the Rhine River and Rotterdam. The gates took six years to build and cost $500 million. That's a big investment for something that you've only had to use once or twice since it was built. $150 billion were lost in New Orleans. I don't think I need to say more. How many people were killed? Sandy, another storm, $70 billion. We don't have those damages. But they did in the past. Your Katrina moment was in? 53. 1953. Yeah, but 53 was our real wake-up call. A storm blowing in from over the North Sea from the West. What happened? It actually swallowed the southwestern part of the Netherlands. Uh, the dams, dikes, and levees broke, and the water flowed in, taking away lives of almost 2,000 people. A lot of families were ripped apart. The Dutch still refer to it as the disaster, because they haven't had one since, not a single death from flooding in 65 years. They've learned the lessons of the past well. Dutch engineers calculate how high and strong dikes and dams must be to withstand the most extreme weather, a one in 10,000 storm. Rotterdam is at the forefront of defensive design. This basketball court can hold 450,000 gallons of storm runoff. This sloping park atop a shopping center is a storm surge barrier. And this world-class rowing facility doubles as a flood reservoir. The Dutch pride themselves on blending form and function. So what is this place? These look like dunes. They are but dunes. But I take it this is the Netherlands, so it's not just dunes. No, these are man-made dunes. Hank Oving took us to one of his favorite projects along the North Sea. The beach town of Kotwick was vulnerable until Dutch engineers created these natural-looking dunes. Many beaches in the U.S. have man-made dunes, but they are nothing like this. And these dunes protect the town yes. from a sea surge or a big storm. Sea surge, storm, and also we incorporate sea level rise of the future. They also integrated urban planning to unclog Kotwick streets when tourists flock to the beach and to raise the height of the dunes to 25 feet above sea level, engineers built a parking garage. Under yeah. the dunes. Under the dunes. So under this whole stretch, is, it looks like, I don't know, several football fields. Yes. Under all of this is a, a parking garage. garage. Almost 700 cars can park here. Could a structure like this have saved New Jersey beach communities from Sandy? Yes, it could. The story will continue after this. You might call the Netherlands the storm drain of Europe. Several major rivers empty here. When France and Germany flooded like this two years ago, most of that water ended up in the Netherlands but towns and cities in Holland weren't inundated, largely because of something the Dutch are doing that defies logic. They are lowering dikes and dams along some rivers. Rivers are living elements in a landscape, and they become bigger when there's more water and become smaller when there's less. And they need to have that capacity. So you went from flood control to controlled flooding. Yeah. You have to let some places flood so you can keep other places dry? Yeah. The Dutch call it room for the river. So th this is where your old house was? Yeah. Vic Gremmer, a social worker in the village of Workendam, personally had to make room for the Merveid River. Hundreds of people like him had to move so their property could be used as floodplains. So the government comes and asks you to leave. Did you have a choice? Not really. We, uh, we had a choice uh, to leave or stay, but on their conditions. The conditions? He could remain in the area, but had to sell the family home to the government. He used the money to build a new house on higher ground. What did you think of that when they 
tore your house down. But the old house, there are 25 years of memories. It's really the end of, uh, I'll get uh, emotional. <laughs> but he said he did it for the greater good. Allowing the swollen river to pool in this new floodplain could save thousands of people from flooding downstream in Rotterdam. The idea of moving people out of the floodplains in the US, we'd be talking about millions of people. That would be a really tough sell. You pay for people to be in the most vulnerable places of your country. There's a national flood insurance program that is going bankrupt. You pay disaster bills every year. In the rebuilding, it's costing a lot of money. It's wasted. That waste seems built into our disaster DNA. In the U.S., FEMA deals with natural disasters. Its primary mission is not to prevent, but to respond. FEMA helps disaster victims build back, usually the same structure in the same place. People's apartments were flooded, people's businesses, our critical infrastructure, all of our substations, so we had no power. Don Zimmer was mayor of Hoboken, New Jersey, when Hurricane Sandy hit six years ago. She told us the city of 55,000 people right across the Hudson River from Manhattan was almost entirely underwater. In some neighborhoods, 10 feet of water? 10 feet of water, yes. And there was fish in people's apartments. It was waste, it was oil, it was a toxic mix in our city. She said Hoboken got money from FEMA to put things back pretty much the way they were, but she wanted to rebuild smarter. It doesn't help for me to have a fire station is individually protected, but there's water all around it. That fire station won't be able to help anyone in the middle of a storm. It just doesn't make sense. So why can't you just get the money and use it as you see best? That's just not the way it works. She says that's when Hank Ovink entered the picture. Sean Donovan, then Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, tapped Ovink for President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Task Force. The two came up with an idea for an international design competition to fix what Sandy had destroyed, following the Dutch philosophy, rebuild differently for the future. Ovink helped convince the federal government to cough up almost a billion dollars for it. You know, in, in the U.S., that sounds kind of crazy. Yeah. A uh, billion dollars for a competition to rebuild. Something like that had never been done before. Never been done in this capacity, so they also had to believe my blue eyes and my story and saying, OK, we believe this young man coming from the Netherlands. Let's work with him. A proposal that will protect Hoboken and its neighbors was awarded $230 million of the competition money. A Dutch design team came up with the winning plans, with a Dutch twist. A storm surge defense disguised as a park with a boathouse. Benches and outdoor seating as barriers to keep the Hudson from drowning the city again. Coming up with the plan was the easy part. Convincing residents to go along was much harder. There were people that were calling out like, give back the money. So let me get this clear, that even after the devastation of Sandy, people were not convinced that they needed flood protection? Well, people are really concerned, for example, about their property values. What would the property values of Hoboken be if we're flooded on a regular basis and our entire city is destroyed? After consulting with the community, the plans were amended and most residents got on board. Hoboken plans to break ground next year. It could be the first test for Ovink's vision in the U.S. It's going to move forward, and I'm very confident that when that next storm hits, because it's going to hit, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and we will be prepared, and we will be a model to show that this approach can work. It's a choice in the end. It's a human choice. We can think about that future as an opportunity, or close our eyes and do nothing and let it happen to us and see more death and despair, more assets and people lost.